Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, first of all, uh, for training uh, for this opportunity uh, to present about um, uh, Fandom's uh, layer one technology, also a bit about the new metal middleware research and the new paper we've got out, and also about how it kind of um, impacts uh, kind of the future of decentralized applications. <clears throat> so I want to talk about three things. So the way Fandom consensus works briefly, uh, challenges to do with smart contracts, in particular in relation to DeFi, because that's where a lot of money is, is stored, and also some middleware developments that um, we, we, we've done um, over the past uh, you know, couple, couple of years or so. So first of all, what is Phantom um, in terms of its technology? Well, it's a fast, scalable, and secure layer one platform. Um, it's permissionless, so anybody can join and leave the network at any time. It's leaderless, so um, there's no like, special ranking of nodes or anything like that. All nodes are uh, created equal, or all, all validated nodes are created equal. And it's completely open source. So uh, it's available on our GitHub. There's technical papers that are released. We released quite an extensive one uh, just a few days ago. And I think um, when Andre tweeted uh, a couple of days ago, he kind of described it best in four words, localized, decentralized, adversarial consensus. Um, that's what it's uh, really about. And it's based on uh, the principles of um, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant technology. So what that means is that um, transactions are confirmed as soon as they enter and leave, as soon as, as soon as they enter the network. So there's no waiting for the next block to be mined or anything like that. And we've got our own consensus algorithm and messaging algorithms that uh, allow us to get the order of transactions in the end, uh, which is uh, uh, quite a complicated process. And that's where a lot of the work is done in terms of uh, the, the research we've been doing at a consensus level. So because of these technology developments, we've been able to um, achieve certain metrics. So we're able to get transactions confirmed within one to two seconds, or at the moment it's actually, it's actually sub one second uh, to create these uh, event blocks that the transactions are stored in. It's um, low fees because we can process probably around a few thousand EVM-based transactions per second at the moment. And they usually cost a fraction of a cent or for, for the more complicated smart contract transactions, uh, a few cents. Um, and it's entirely EVM compatible. So the way you write, compile, and deploy smart contracts on Ethereum um, works the same way uh, pretty much on our chain as well, the, the, the main network that we call the Opera chain. <coughs> so there's three layers, as I mentioned, there's consensus, there's the, um, the, the middleware, which consists right now of the Ethereum virtual machine, and there's um, a series of APIs. So it's fully web, um, web-free integrated, it's integrated with, we've got GraphQL APIs with a, ver a variety of different RPC servers. So that's kind of the technology stack we have at the moment. <coughs> um, so a bit more about the, um, the consensus that I mentioned before. Um, so asynchronous, there's no waiting for a transaction to be processed. As soon as it enters the network, it needs to get confirmed by two thirds of the total validating power of the network. Um, it's secure in terms of you need one third of the total value name power of the network plus one um, in, in order to perform a successful DDoS against the network. And two, so conversely, two thirds, of, um, two thirds of nodes must be honest nodes in order to confirm transactions. Um, they're inexpensive, uh, uh, all validated nodes are credit equal so long as you fulfill the minimum requirements. And finality, because it's ABFT, is deterministic. So as soon as you a transaction reaches two thirds consensus for the network, the transaction is confirmed, it's done. All you need is one confirmation. You don't need a series of confirmations afterwards. It's not probabilistic in any way. There's no um, such thing as like say longest chain rule. So it, it's ir ir um, immutable and irreversible after you get that two thirds consensus. Um, and this is a diagram, a bit about the node architecture and a link to the latest paper. So as you can see in, in, in the diagram, we've got uh, the transactions are ba basically grouped into event blocks and they're also grouped into what we call epochs to so the cache. And then these epochs are, are stored transaction, da um, transaction data that can be executed against the, the Ethereum virtual machine. And on top of that, we've got the series of APIs, RPC servers, web free JS that I described about before. Um, so what are some challenges in DeFi? Um, well, with DeFi smart contracts, um, there are a lot of hacks that have taken place. Um, a lot of money has been stolen already from the beginning of the year to May 2021, um, about $156 million has been stolen. Apparently 120 million has been stolen in 2020. I think the numbers are higher than that from what the articles reported. <coughs> um, so we need to have secured contracts. Um, also performance is an issue because the usually the smart contract, um, the, uh, these DeFi smart contracts 
uh, that are executed, transactions that are executed, they're really, really sophisticated, which is one of the brilliant things about DeFi is that you can gain a lot of efficiencies via execution of smart contracts. But that also means that it, it, it costs a lot to execute these smart contracts. So first of all, multiple transactions are usually required um, to claim, restake, lend, collateralize, and borrow, et cetera. Uh, transactions can be pretty complex. For example, we can have multiple swaps in order to get the best pricing. <clears throat> and this sort of sophistication you know, it, it is efficient, but it's also not efficient in the sense that it, it consumes a lot of gas fees. And the executions are quite slow, particularly on Ethereum. You're able to wait for several blocks. It can be several minutes before you can be sure that your transaction is really successfully executed. So right now, in terms of testing, we've got things like auditors that are extremely useful, um, that are quite reliable, but they're not foolproof. And we saw that, for example, like in the popsicle hack lately, um, unit tests, we need um, um, uh, more than just unit tests. And also um, secure libraries do help prevent um, exploits, but, they, it, but the exploits increasingly become more sophisticated, for example, with the use of flash loans. Um, so we've been doing some research in Phantom on the middleware to try and uh, make storage more efficient and make testing more efficient. So recently, um, uh, the people that we partnered with at University of Yonsei and um, University of Sydney as well uh, produced this paper where they've managed to um, construct a um, construct a new type of, of a, a storage system for um, uh, the history of smart contract data to make testing a lot more efficient um, than uh, it, it, it is currently the case. So, for example. Um, they have created what they call substates, which are these snapshots of the chain, and they're able to compress uh, a get full node by about uh, uh, um, fifty percent. Uh, so you can create a, more, a lot more um, efficient archive nodes. They mean um, able to um, execute the history of transactions um, four to five, to, uh, four point five times faster uh, compared to like using a get full node system. They're able to do it um, uh, 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 using parallelization as well. So right now when you execute um, replayable transactions, it all is done single threaded. They're able to do it across multiple cores. So in 44 cores, 44 cores, they're able to uh, do transaction execution at 50X times, which means that a lot more, they can do a lot more testing on, for example, testing of hard forks. So sometimes uh, um, uh, old um, uh, contracts or contracts in the past are no longer compatible or they have some sort of issues with new um uh, with new forks that occur, so or new upgrades to the network, so people are allowed uh, able to do things such as contract fuzzing, which is basically uh, the ability to do randomized inputs into smart contracts um, in order to test uh, the, the behavior of the smart contracts uh, based on its output. So you're able to find a lot of bugs by doing what is essentially brute force testing. Um, this um, allows us to um, uh, uh, this allows us to basically um, test for a lot of bugs and smart contracts in a much more efficient way. And it allows us also to evaluate um, uh, wasteful instructions that exist in the smart contract. So these sorts of tools are very, very important for testing and building smart contracts, particularly related to DeFi, where there's a lot of money stored in these smart contracts. Um, we also need a smarter virtual machine. Um, so right now, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine is what we call a stack-based register virtual machine. Um, currently, with our ABF key consensus, we can process a uh, maximum of a few thousand transactions based on the EVM. There's a lot of bottlenecks, especially related to uh, um, storage reads and writes. So specifically, the use of you know S store and S load um, of code instructions. Um, so, so right now, the, what the researchers are doing is that they're building a new register-based virtual machine that's solidly compa uh, compatible. They, they're, they're trying to um, compress the bytecode to make the storage a lot more efficient on chain. And they're also trying to merge off codes to create what are called super instruction sets. So they're basically trying to develop a new efficient virtual machine that can execute smart contracts um, where it improves the storage, it improves of ac accessing um, data, which is where the, uh, the, um, the real uh, bottlenecks are, and also to merge off codes together to make also the execution a bit faster at the virtual machine level and also to compress storage. <laughs> so in terms of future research, um, as I mentioned before, um, the team and we at Phantom are researching a new a virtual machine, a new type of compiler, um, uh, and a new type of interpreter to go with it as well. Um, <laughs> We want to try and improve storage and also consensus speed. So um, 
right now they had um they, they, they have um come up with a new type of data structure. So I can't really talk too much about this because the paper isn't um, published yet. But they um, have created a new type of storage storage data called um storage request, I believe, and it slightly increases uh, the size of the amount of data you got to store on chain. But with the efficiencies gained in in, in the way they're able to store um, uh, data now compared to like a a GEF uh, archive node or a GEF four node, uh, it, it's really not a much of an extension to storage. I think it's about two or three percent of um, in, ter in terms of additional storage. But they're able to execute um, these S0 and S0 instructions. So basically retrieving and um, and loading up data, reading and writing data from the blockchain, which is where a lot of the slowness comes with the EVM. So actually executing um, other opcodes that are not related to storage in the EVM is actually really, really fast. Uh, we found in our research, so that's not really an issue. Where it is an issue is reading and writing to storage. Because of the way that it's, um, because of the way that the EVM is designed and, and, and associated data structures are designed with it, so with this new data structure they've created, they're currently able to um, uh, execute S2 instruction um, six times faster and S2 instruction about two times faster. Now that's in uh, the experimentation they've done at the moment, so we we'll have to see how it actually works in production in the end. But that's what they've done so far, which is pretty incredible. Because what this means, for example, with other EVM compatible chains, or in particular Ethereum, is that we're able to execute, you know, smart contracts, you know, several times faster than they can already execute. So this means all other things being equal, we can move you know, a few thousand transactions per second in the orders of tens of thousands of EVM-based transactions. Because right now, for our network, it's not really consensus that's a bottleneck, although technically it still is a bottleneck. The big bottleneck has to do with the Ethereum virtual machine. It has to do with um, the slowness of accessing data and reading and writing data with the Ethereum virtual machine. And that's something that I really uh, want to stress. That's a bit big bottleneck for us. And so that's an area of research that we're very much interested in. Um, the research that I've also done um, in, um, in creating um, subsafes at the moment uh, allow us to you know, launch archive nodes a lot more efficiently, be able to, for people to be able to sync nodes much more efficiently than is currently the case. And for um, uh, us to basically have a much more compressed storage space than we already have um, on our network. So, you know, data compression is a big issue, particularly if you're able to process thousands of transactions per second. If you hit that kind of threshold, you've got to also consider how much storage is taken up as well. So if we can implement these, um, what, what the research so far into um, the way Founder behaves, that's great, it will compress storage. And if we have a virtual machine on top of that that has additional bytecode compression, then it can reduce storage even further to that. So that's so these things are kind of important because um, we need them to you know basically power smart contracts in the system of Ethereum because um, the amount of uh, total value lock on chain is growing dramatically. It's reached about three hundred million dollars at the moment. At the beginning of the year, it was virtually nothing. We have over fifty projects deployed, probably over hundred actually. The biggest ones being, for example, like Spooky, Spirit, Sushi Swamp, uh, Curve and Cream, AMMs, um, as well as, of course, like Chainlink as a, as a great Oracle provider. And we've also got cross-chain compa compatibility with stable points like DAI, USD, and USDC that we've got from other chains, uh, such as Ethereum, and, um, and, and, and using um, um, uh, cross-chains such as multi-chain and REN at the moment. And we're also launching NFT platforms as well. And we, we've got some announcements coming out about that as well. And as more and more projects launch in Ethereum and as the usage increases, we need to have a more and more scalable system to cater for those increased users. And we also need to have a more robust testing system that people can rely on, you know, being able to, for example, use contract fuzzers more efficiently. And so they can test against future hard forks. <laughs> they can also test the smart contracts against different exploits. Um, by, for example, using contract fuzzing uh, to make sure that, you know, that, th that these sorts of hacks won't occur where people will lose, you know, literally millions, you know, tens of millions, sometimes even hundreds of millions of dollars. And so it's really, really important from a security point of view, from a testing point of view, and also for a performance point of view, the sort of research that's been done at the moment at Yonsei University and, uh, and the University of Sydney. So um, thanks everyone for uh, listening to my presentation. I hope you've kind of found that a bit interesting. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate it. 
uh, learning a lot about Phantom. For anyone uh, that doesn't know, we currently have Chainlink price feeds live on the Phantom test net. Uh, if you're building on Phantom, please reach out to us. We'd love to speak with you, help you out any way that we can.